Section 2.4, one-sided limits. All right, we've already encountered, foreshadowed if you like, um, the idea of a one-sided limit. We've already seen uh, functions, if I may speak anthropomorphically, which we're good to go as long as we have graphs to analyze limits um, with this idea of trying to do something. We've already seen functions that try to pass through one point from the left and a different point from the right. When such a thing happens, the limit, or what we might refer to now as the two-sided limit, it doesn't exist. But it's kind of like the half limit exists, it's, it's that the one-sided limit exists. Limits from the left and from the right exist. Uh, here's an example of a function. It's the absolute, it's uh, the function y equals x divided by the absolute value of x. So undefined at zero, right, undefined at zero. And if x is positive, then the absolute value of x equals x itself. We cancel and get one. If x is negative, then the numerator and denominator differ by a negative sign, and we get negative one out. Uh, so it's got this little gap of uh, a jump discontinuity, we'll call it here in the next section or two. But the limit certainly doesn't exist. Look at the graph. Is there a point it tries to pass through? Well, if we look at x values approaching zero from the negative direction, that yields points along the graph of the function that are moving along trying to pass through the point from the left, trying to pass through the point zero, negative one. <clears throat> if we look from the right, if we take input values x that are positive and get close to zero, then the points on the function try to pass through the point zero comma one. So the idea will be we'll consider um, one-sided limits, limits from the left and limits from the right. Uh, and we can talk about it anthropomorphically if you like. Uh, that'll do as long as we've got graphs and talk about the function trying to pass through um, a particular point. Here is a bit of an informal, was this not as informal as a function trying to pass through a point, uh, but we're gonna talk arbitrarily close and sufficiently close uh, in the following definition. And you know, we're gonna change that into epsilons and deltas here in a little while, but to give it um, a, a little cleaner definition, but not gone um, full rigor just yet. Suppose f of x is defined on an interval c to b, open interval c to b, where c is less than b. Okay, so that means the functions defined close to c and for input values bigger than c. What happens at c, nobody cares, and it looks like nobody cares what happens to the left of c for numbers strictly less than c as well. Okay, it's because we're gonna consider the behavior for x bigger than c. So this guarantees the functions defined uh, close to c and for values bigger than c. If f of x approaches arbitrarily close to l, as x approaches sufficiently close to c from within that interval, then we say that f has right-hand limit l at c and we write the limit as x approaches c from the positive direction, notice the little superscript of a plus sign, of f of x equals l. Anthropomorphically, that means, we've got a picture down below, anthropomorphically, that means when we follow along the curve and x gets close to c and is bigger than c, it's on the positive side of c, it's on the right-hand side of c, then the points on the curve try to pass through this point c comma l. Of course, it doesn't matter what happens at c, it's a limit. Left-hand limit, okay, we'll just kind of mirror image what we have here. Let f of x be defined on an interval a to c where a is less than c. Okay, this will include x values that are close to c and less than c on the negative side of c to the left hand side of C. If f of x approaches arbitrarily close, so the remainder of the wording will be quite similar to what we had above, that'll be the epsilon part, arbitrarily close to m, 
as X approaches sufficiently close to C from within the interval A to C. So that'll be the delta part with a little added disclaimer that the X values are less than C in this case. Then we say that F has left hand limit M at X equals uh, at C and we write the limit as X approaches C from the negative direction of F of X equals M. There's a little superscript of a negative there. So I have trouble highlighting it. So superscript of a positive for right hand limit coming from the right hand side, the positive side. Superscript of a negative sign, left hand limit, X is approaching C from the negative side, the left hand side. And the picture for the second one is, I uh, follow the X values along where they start getting close to C and the curve tries to pass through this point C comma N. Does it, doesn't it, nobody cares and, and because it's a limit question. So uh, there's a somewhat more formal way of talking about one-sided limits. It's the same stuff we had when we talked about two-sided limits with the exception that in one case, I'm only looking at X values greater than C. In the other case, I'm only looking at X values less than C. Before, we took X values close to C. They could be close to C and less than C. They could be close to C and bigger than C uh, before when we were doing what we would, would, would now call two-sided limits. Let's look at some examples. Okay. Uh, here is the graph of a function. It's the function f of x equals four minus x squared, square root of, uh, write that as y equals the square root of four minus x squared. Rearrange it, you get x squared plus y squared equals four. It's a circle of radius two, O. Oh, but the y values, the output values, the square root, they're never negative. So you actually only get the top half of the circle. You've been exposed to this before, I'm sure. It might have been a while. But uh, four minus x squared, square root of, it's a semicircle of radius two centered at the origin. Uh, the domain, <laughs> it's claimed is negative two to two. Right, um, Anything bigger than two, and we're gonna have square roots of negatives, and we can't do that. Anything less than negative two, and we're gonna have square roots of negatives, and we can't do that. So indeed, uh, the domain is negative two to two, and in fact, this is what the graph looks like. Discuss its one and two-sided limits. Okay, uh, well, the graph, if you like, it begins at negative two and ends at two, so I can't talk about two-sided limits at negative two and two. I would need the function to be defined on an open interval containing, uh, say, two. And it's not, because it's not defined to the right of two. And similarly, it's not defined on an open interval containing negative two, except possibly negative two itself, because it's not defined on the negative side of negative two over here. All right, but that's just a perfect setting for a one-sided limit. So if we'll analyze this, let's do it, you know, anthropomorphically, what it tries to do. We see from the graph, as given here, that as x approaches negative two from the right, okay, so that'd be x values approaching negative two along the x-axis here, we get corresponding points on the graph of the function that come down around that semicircle, and they're going to try to pass through that point right there. So we'd say the limit as x approaches negative two, negative two, from the positive direction, from the right, because there is nothing to the left, of four minus x squared square root of equals zero, tries to pass through this point right here, and this is the point negative two, zero. Then that limit is zero. Does it succeed in passing through? Uh, well, from one side, yeah in this new modified version of looking at what happens from one side, yes. Regular old, you know, does it do the same thing from both sides, two-sided limit, no, we've got a problem with that. It's, it's undefined to the left of negative two, as we discussed. But the one-sided one limit exists, and it's zero. And it's the same kind of behavior over here, as we take x values approaching positive two from the negative direction, the x values in this region, that produces corresponding points along the graph that are moving along the graph here, and they're going to try to pass through this point two comma zero from the left. 
So the limit as x approaches positive 2 from the negative direction of 4 minus x squared square root of equals 0 tries to pass through the point positive 2, 0. Uh, I won't normally write the plus signs in front of positive numbers. It's just there's a lot going on here. We've got uh, approaching negative numbers from the positive side and approaching positive numbers from the negative sides. At least in this first one, I'll include the, the plus sign for the positive 2. But from the left, the graph is trying to pass through the point 2, 0. Let's apply a one-sided version of Dr. Bob's anthropomorphic idea to conclude that the one-sided limit then is 0. Uh, the graph succeeds in containing these points. That's how I've written it up here. Yeah, those actually are points on the graph, though that's irrelevant to a limit question. Now, it'll be relevant to something else. It'll be relevant when we talk about continuity, but for now it doesn't matter that the points actually uh, are points on the graph of the curve. I have trouble talking about passing through. Through seems to imply it, uh, you know, it's, it's on both sides. So we got an, uh, maybe a bit of a problem with the passing through the point. From one side it tries to pass through. That's how I have to word it. Uh, any other points? between negative two and two, any other C value that's between negative two and two excluding the endpoint, we see the function tries to pass through the point C F of C. For the record, it's C uh, four minus C squared square root of, and by the way, it succeeds, but that's not relevant to a limit question. It's relevant to something else though. So uh, anthropomorphic definition of limit, uh, all of the uh, two-sided limits exist between negative two and two. Establishing that more rigorously would be probably a little bit nightmarish. Uh, establishing it um, with the idea of it trying to pass through a point, no problems. It tries to pass through all these points. It succeeds passing through all these points, left and right. Uh, notice again, the two-sided limit, or we may just refer to it as the limit. When you hear limit, it's implied that it's a two-sided limit. We've got one-sided limits and we've got limits. Um, I'll probably emphasize two-sided limits when we're in a setting like here, where we've got one and two-sided limits going on in the same question. But the two-sided limit at plus or minus two doesn't exist. As we observe, hey, the function's not defined on an open interval containing negative two or an open, on an open interval containing two. Uh, so I can't talk about two-sided limits at those endpoints. Yeah, the function's not defined at all for x less than negative two and greater than two. We commented as to what the domain was. Uh, the limit as x approaches negative two from the positive side, the limit as x approaches positive two from the negative side, f of x, neither of these exist. That is, you try to see what happens for x values over here, there's nothing happening. The function's not defined. So I can't say what the function's trying to get close to. Same thing over here. X is bigger than two. We take a limit as x approaches positive two from the positive direction. X approaches negative two from the negative direction. There's nothing there. So it's meaningless to make a claim about the function trying to pass through anything. Though the limits are not defined. Those one-sided limits are not defined. And that's what's stated here. Uh, this shows, uh, let's see, neither exists. I actually think I've got the signs on these backwards. It should read limit as x approaches negative two from the negative direction and limit as x approaches positive two from the positive direction. Excuse me, typo, neither of these exist. Excuse me. Uh, the picture idea, I see. We're approaching negative two from the negative direction, nothing there. Approaching positive two from the positive direction. Sorry, I'll get the, I'll get the typos edited in the, in the notes but this should be a negative here and a positive there on those superscripts, if you will. So, and I do want to go on about this a little bit. If we tried to evaluate a limit all the time, just by substituting in, we'd have a problem here. Can, uh, can you evaluate a limit as X approaches two of four minus X squared just by plugging in two? If you do, you get out zero but the limits don't exist. The two-sided limits don't exist. So 
Evaluating limits is more complicated than substitution. Sometimes you can substitute. When? When can you evaluate limits by substitution? I can think of two times. Um, well, it's when those limit rules are satisfied uh, from section 2.2, I think it was, uh, and, and established in section 2.3. You can substitute in when you got polynomials and you can substitute in when you got rational functions and you don't get division by zero. Definitely those times you can substitute in. That was theorem 2.2 and 2.3. That was so important, I still remember the numbers of them. Uh, you could substitute in, the root rule said, you could substitute in, um, if there's no problems with square roots and negatives, was roughly what the root rule said. Uh, but if I plug in two, we get the square root of zero. Is that a problem? No, square root of zero is zero, but you don't evaluate limits by substitution. As evidenced by the fact that if you plug in two, you get out zero. And that's not the limit. The limit doesn't exist. It isn't the problem of a square root of zero. It's the problem that X is wiggling around. When I say limit, I can't tell you what X is. It's a long story. Thankfully, mostly behind us, uh, for two-sided limits at least, in the previous section with all that epsilon delta stuff. So if I could put my finger on exactly where X is, this wouldn't be such a long story. I can't tell you where X is. I'll tell you it's close to C or in this case with this one-sided limit stuff, it's close to C and bigger than C or close to C and less than C. You don't evaluate limits by substitution unless there's something really special going on. Here, that special thing isn't going on. If I have numbers close to two, it's not the two that's a problem. In fact, the two is irrelevant to the conversation in a sense. F of two is irrelevant to the conversation. Doesn't matter what happens at two, in other words. And if I've got numbers less than two, we're good to go. But close to two are numbers bigger than two, like 2.1. You square 2.1, you get something bigger than four and you got square roots and negatives, that's the problem. So you can't evaluate limits by substitution, except in certain special cases. And we've enumerated some of those special cases. If, if only I could just make a concise little list and certainly we would. So. It's complicated. Something goes wrong when you see square roots of zeros potentially. If you substitute in and you get a square root of zero, maybe that's the limit, maybe it ain't. It depends on the function. Um, when you see square root of zero in a limit, there's concerns that you might have square roots of negatives. And it depends on the function. It depends if the function could be negative near the value that gives that zero. And here it could be. So be very careful. Limits are subtle things. Uh, you don't, largely you don't evaluate limits by substitution unless you got a special kind of function like a polynomial, a rational function that doesn't give zeros, maybe a square root function that doesn't give the square root of negatives or the square root of zero, though the square root of zero may or may not work out. Like here, it doesn't work out for the two-sided limit. And here's some more elaboration on that. The two-sided limits don't exist at two or negative two. The function ain't even defined on an open interval containing those points. And if you go willy-nilly plug in two and negative two, you get to square root of zero, that's zero. Yeah, that's the function value, but it's not the limit. The two-sided limit's not defined. It's no coincidence that that's the one-sided limits which do exist though. So, it's a long story. Uh, let's look at another one. Let's look at uh, number 10 as well. Okay, they give us a piecewise defined function. Excellent time to deal with piecewise defined functions when we're talking one-sided limits. Uh, they've defined the function to be x, one, or zero, depending on the location of the x values. We'll have a graph of it on the next slide. They've asked you to graph it uh, and find the domain and range. Okay, domains are easy. Ranges are hard unless you have a graph. Apparently you can graph it, so we'll be good to go on that. At what point C, if any, does the two-sided limit exist? At what points does the left-hand limit exist, but the right-hand limit doesn't? At what point does the right-hand limit exist, but the left-hand limit doesn't? So that's their choice of questions. We'll explore two-sided limits and one-sided limits. Okay, now the graph is 
uh, y equals x, so it's a straight line with slope one for x between negative one and zero, except for zero, and x between zero and one, except for zero. At zero, the function takes on the value one, uh, and let's see, it takes on the value zero, so it's a constant function of zero for x strictly less than negative one and strictly greater than one. Okay, well, I can graph a constant function zero, I can graph this point, and I can graph the line y equals x. So I think I can graph this function. So here's what we'll get. All right, so we got a straight line, negative one to zero, at zero, at x equals zero, the function value is one, so we get a point up here. Uh, zero to one, the straight line continues. At one and negative one, you use the straight line segment, so we color in these endpoints here. Uh, for x less than negative one, we get zero. So hopefully the resolution's good enough to see a blue graph of the function here of zero up to negative one, undefined there got that little gap in it and sort of a mirror image happens over here. Okay, so there's the graph of the function, usual graphing of a piecewise defined function. What's the domain? Is this defined everywhere? Yeah, for x less than negative one, it's uh, this here at negative one, it, it's defined here. Uh, it's defined at zero, it's defined as this point. Um, zero to one is defined here, greater than one, it's defined over here. Okay, it's defined for all real numbers. How about the range? That'd be the y values that come out of the function. Uh, it never produces a y value less than negative one. It never produces a y value greater than positive one. Does it produce all of the y values between negative one and one? Uh, negative one, yeah, this point gives negative one. All these points give the numbers along the y-axis between negative one and zero. Does it ever produce zero? Yeah, a whole bunch of times. All of these are zero values of the function. Zero to one along here. At one, you get one out here. You actually get one out in a couple of places. At zero, the value is one, and at one, the value of the function is one. So everything between negative one and one is in fact produced by the function, and that's the range. Are you good at finding ranges? Uh, only as good as you are at graphing probably you can't find the range of a function without graphing it. You're gonna be as good as anybody else at graphing functions when I get done with you in calculus one. So you'll be as good as anybody else at finding ranges. Domains, uh, sometimes you can even find the domains just from the algebraic definition of the function. We've got a graph, we may as well use it. Okay, they wanted to talk about, um, uh, what was it, two-sided limits? Yeah, limit as x approaches c of f of x. What's up with that? Well, look at the graph. We've got a graph, let's use the anthropomorphic ideas. We're talking two-sided limits, so this is the stuff from section, what was it, 2.2? Uh, looks like it tries to pass through points for all these x values. In fact, it succeeds until we get to negative one. And we've got, from the left, it's trying to pass through the point negative one, zero. And from the right, it's trying to pass through the point negative one, one. There's not a single point it's trying to pass through. The two-sided limit doesn't exist at negative one. How about negative one over to zero? Uh, yeah, it tries to pass through points and succeeds. Uh, what about at zero? Does the limit exist? Got a hole in it. Yeah, well, limit exists. It's trying to pass through the origin. It fails but it tried, and that's all Dr. Bob's anthropomorphic definition of the limit requires, tries to pass through that point, so the limit exists, and is zero. The function value is not zero, but the limit exists. We've been through several of these kinds. Tries to pass through points until we get to one, and we've got a problem, same kind of problem we had at negative one, and then beyond one, it's a nice horizontal line, it's a constant function, and the limits exist. So we've got two-sided limits existing everywhere except at negative one and positive one. So uh, in this verbiage here, simply uh, it says it, it, roughly that. So let's see, tries to pass through points. I summarized it on the next page. Yeah, it's plus or minus one. We've got a problem. Here we go, here's the summary. So for C, anything except negative one and positive one 
the limit exists, the two-sided limit exists. Uh, we looked at it in pieces in uh, negative infinity, you should read negative infinity to negative one over here. It's a constant function, tries to pass through points, succeeds. Uh, between negative one and one, it's this linear function, tries to pass through points, it succeeds except at zero. Succeeds doesn't matter for existence of a limit. And then greater than one, uh, constant function and limit exists. So we'll uh, really just take the whole real line, yeah, sorry, another little type of negative infinity to infinity and knock out negative one and one. So this would be the way you would write the whole real line except for negative one and one as a union of some intervals. See appendix A1 for more of that kind of thing. We could write it as inequalities as well if you like. So uh, two-sided limits everywhere except where it's got these gaps in it. Even where it's got a hole in it, the two-sided limits still exist. It's those gaps that are causing some problems. Perfect place to have a conversation about one-sided limits. And that's what parts C and D are about. So let's look at um, one-sided limits. Limits as X approaches C from the negative side for, for all C values. That would mean when we come from the negative side, the function tries to pass through a particular point. Well, we had the two-sided limits existing along here. So when we come from the left in particular, it tries to pass through a point and it su succeeds. What about at negative one? Does the limit as X approaches negative one from the negative side, does that one-sided limit exist at negative one? Yeah, it tries to pass through the point negative one comma zero when I only concentrate on what happens for X values less than negative one and close to negative one. So that one-sided limit exists and it's zero. It tried to pass through that point right there. That's the point negative one comma zero so zero, the y coordinate of that point, is the limit, the one-sided limit, as x approaches negative one from the negative side. We're only talking about limits from the left. Okay, uh, we had the two-sided limits existing for all these points. So the limit from the left will exist, it tries to pass through points and succeeds. Uh, remember, I don't consider negative one when I'm coming in from the left down here. We took care of that up here with the point negative one, zero. All these other points, it tries to pass through. In fact, it succeeds as we read from left, from the left, from the negative side. Uh, it tries to pass through this point when we come in from the left. It fails, but that doesn't matter. It tries to pass through the point. Limit exists. Limit exists. Limit exists. Limit exists. Limit exists. What about at one? It tries to pass through this point. By the way, it succeeds. Pass through is maybe not the best way to put it because it's a one-sided limit. It tries to contain that point, and it does. But that doesn't matter. It tries to pass through, <clears throat> tries to contain this point. So the limit from the left exists. In, in fact, it's one. The limit as X approaches one from the negative side of this function is the value one. Because this is the point one comma one, that second one, that's the limit value. The first one is what X approaches. Uh, and then when we pick up over here, bigger than one, constant function, those one-sided limits all exist. Well, the two-sided limits even existed. So the limit as X approaches C from the negative side of F of X, that was all of all the X, X values. That exists for all real numbers C. So all the one-sided limits from the left exist. There's the weirdness that at negative one, we get this zero out. At positive one, we get this, this one out, the Y coordinate to this point and the other shouldn't appear too weird. Uh, what happens if we look at limits from the positive side? Well, I'll talk about what happens when we come in from this direction and what it tries to pass through. Let's do that. Okay, I'm working part C and D together. They ask us where does one one-sided limit exist and the other one doesn't. Uh, so far, we've seen that the limits from the negative side, all of those exist. Let's look at limits from the positive side. Trying to pass through points and succeeding, trying to pass through points, tries to pass through this point from the positive side. It fails, but this is the point one comma zero, so the limit is zero. It tries to contain that point one comma zero. Suppose I take X values bigger than one and look at what happens as we move to the left. We come in from the positive side. Uh, I get points that the function tries to pass through and succeeds till we get down here and it's still trying to pass through a point from the left. Good enough, limit exists. Limit from the positive side exists. 
Similarly, all these one-sided limits exist. The limit as x approaches negative one from the positive side, tries to pass through this point. So that limit is negative one. The coordinates of this point are negative one, negative one, and it's the second negative one that gives the limit out. All right, it's the y coordinates that give the limits out. And then all the one-sided limits exist where it's constant over here. So we just found out that the um, limit as x approaches c from the positive side of f of x, those also exist for all c. They wanted to know where one of them exists and the other one doesn't. The one-sided limits existed everywhere for all x values. So there, there's no points where just one of the one-sided limits exists. They both exist. They're not always the same, but they both exist. Let's address that sameness as we've answered their question, but um, the left and right limits are the same, except right there, negative one and one. The left-hand limit is zero and the right-hand limit is negative one. Here, the left-hand limit is positive one and the right-hand limit is zero, reading out y values of the points that the function tries to contain. So that has some implications later when we talk continuity. Uh, maybe in the not too distant future when we relate one-sided and two-sided limits. But the one-sided limits all exist. Not all the two-sided limits exist, uh, by the way, as we observed. Back to the notes. Okay, so we've talked, you know, anthropomorphically. And that's a good way to talk about it uh, in terms of having a graph and seeing if limits exist based on the presence of a graph. Problem is, left to our own um, abilities, might not be that good at graphing. I can easily make up a function. I have no clue how to graph. Um, so being given a graph is being given a lot of information. So that allows us to simplify things and talk about what the function tries to do. Well, let's take care of the inevitable the formal definition of one-sided limits. Okay, so this will take the previous comment we had about arbitrarily close, and we'll replace that with an epsilon, and sufficiently close, and we'll replace that with a delta. So this is gonna look a whole bunch like what we had for the formal two-sided definition of limit. Let f of x be defined on an open interval c to b, where c is less than b, okay. The function's defined for x values close to c and bigger than c, is what this means, as before. We say that f of x has a right-hand limit, l at c, and write the same thing we did above if, here comes the epsilon stuff, for every number epsilon greater than zero, there exists a corresponding number delta greater than zero, such that for all x satisfying, x is between c and c plus delta, this implies the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. All right, how does this differ from a two-sided limit? We didn't take a function defined on an open interval containing c except possibly itself. This open interval doesn't contain c. C is an endpoint, but it's not part of the interval because of the little parentheses saying exclude the endpoints. It's an open interval. Um, so we're not requiring the function to be defined to the left of C. That's different from a two-sided limit. And what we had down here in the two-sided limit definition was we had the absolute value of X minus C less than delta and greater than zero. Here we've got half of that. Uh, the absolute value is gone and some things have been rearranged. Notice what this means x is bigger than c and less than c plus delta. Bigger than c, well that's the one-sided stuff, it's on the positive side of c if I look back up here, and it's still, it's close to c, right? The idea is delta is going to be little. So these x values sandwiched between c and c plus delta, they're going to be close to c. Close to means what? Um, all this epsilon and delta stuff is what close to means. And the conclusion over here is the same. So we're getting function values close to L within a distance epsilon, which is arbitrary, by making X values close to C and a little bit bigger than C. They're on the positive side of C as given here. All right, how about left-hand limits? 
well, we'll uh, change this where the functions define and we'll look at x values on the other side of C is all it amounts to. That f of x be defined on an open interval AC where A is less than C. Okay, these are um, x values close to C and less than C on the negative side of C. We say that f of x has left hand limit L at C and right, the limit as x approaches C from the left or from the negative direction of f of x equals L if for every number epsilon greater than zero, there exists a corresponding number delta greater than zero, such that for all x satisfying c minus delta is less than x is less than c, we have the distance from f of x to l less than epsilon. If you've got the limit as l, then whether it's one-sided or two-sided, the, the final statement will be something like what's highlighted here. Where are these x values coming from? Uh, they're less than C, so they're on the negative side of C, uh, and they're close to C. They're within delta distance of C. So, sort of a mirror image of what we have up here. These X values are close to C and bigger than C. These X values are close to C and less than C. When we did two-sided limits, we just said the X values are close to C. I don't care whether they're bigger than or less than. Uh, actually, we need both of those types of x values to satisfy the ultimate conclusion as given here with the epsilons. But this is kind of like half of the definition of a two-sided limit. Makes sense. These are definitions of one-sided limits. Uh, the book does this little thing with the brackets. Let me try to magnify this. They can use yellow and some of their fonts. It's hard to see. Um, they say we'll try to get the function to lie in this region by having x values in this region. Notice these x values are close to C and bigger than C. Over here we've got x values close to C and less than C. There's no difference on what happens along the y-axis. Uh, let's do the same thing, but you know my fondness for yellow and blue bands and green boxes. So I want to have the same kind of conversation in terms of yellow bands and blue bands and green boxes. So what we'll have, let's magnify those pictures. Let epsilon be greater than zero would come first. What we're showing here is, let's see, these x values look like they're less than c, so this would be a limit as x approaches c from the negative side of f of x equals l. Anthropomorphically, I'd say, the graph of the function as we come in from the left tries to pass through this point, or tries to contain this point. Does it? Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Looks like it doesn't in this picture. That doesn't affect the one-sided limit. In terms of the epsilons and deltas, you'll be given an epsilon greater than zero. You'll draw the horizontal band from L minus epsilon to L plus epsilon. These are all the Y coordinates that are within a distance epsilon of L. If you like, we want all function values to lie within this yellow band. We want uh, the f of x minus l, that distance, to be less than epsilon. So geometrically, it translates into, I want the function to lie inside that yellow band. Uh, for input values close to c and to the left of c. Okay? So we need to, for this epsilon, find a delta. We could take a delta this big. You could go this far to the left, cut things off there. Uh, now you've got the graph of the function intersecting the left side of the little green box, actually does it at the corner. I couldn't make delta any bigger or we'd have a little piece of the function sticking out, of the, uh, out below the yellow band. I can make delta smaller. We just uh, slide delta till it's a little bit smaller and we'd still have the function lying inside the yellow band for the corresponding x values. Over here, same idea except now we're looking at the right. Uh, this time we'll take the epsilon band and here's c. We'll look to the right of c and see how far we can go. Not very far, it's because this function's steep. The steepness determines how far you can go in a sense. This one's not quite as steep and you could go further to the left. So certainly there's a, in choosing these deltas, it's somehow related to the steepness of the function, something we'll explore in chapter three. But 
we can go as far as this distance. You go any further and we'll have some bad function values up here that stick out of the yellow band. So I can't go any further than that. In both of these, making the deltas as big as we can, having the intersection right there at the corners of those little green boxes. Notice in this one, we're taking a limit as X approaches C from the negative side. And then we're looking at the corner of the left hand side of the little green box. On this one, we're looking at a corner of the right hand side of the little green box and we're taking X values coming in from the positive direction, the right hand side towards C. So this is basically the conversation we had in terms of uh, little green boxes and yellow bands and blue bands that we had before, except this time we're only concentrating on half of the picture. Uh, the function might not even be defined um, on one side of C for all we know. But there's some verbiage. Uh, I basically just outline what's said there. You have access to the notes. I'd read them because this is not an easy concept. But in terms of a formal definition, there's what we have. Uh, let's use the formal definition. Maybe not a whole lot because it, it's time consuming and difficult. But we need something to establish uh, some of the existence of limits. And here's an excellent one. Let's prove that the limit as X approaches zero from the positive side of the square root of X equals zero. Alrighty, it's an example from the book. It's a pretty fundamental example. I'm added a little notice here. Notice that the limit as X approaches zero of the square root of X does not exist. That is the two-sided limit doesn't exist. This one-sided limit does, the two-sided limit doesn't. Why not? Why can't you just plug in x equals zero, get the square root of zero, which is zero, and say that's the limit? Because you don't evaluate limits by substitution, if only. Where is x in this two-sided limit? Well, it's close to zero. Is it close to zero in positive or close to zero in negative? Well, in a two-sided limit, all I know is it's close to zero. So it could be positive or negative. If it's positive, no problem. Actually, that's what we have in the question we're asked. X is on the positive side of zero. But in the two-sided limit, if X is close to zero, it could be negative. And then we got square roots of negatives and we can't do that. That's informally. That's why this limit doesn't exist. Uh, it's a square roots of negatives problem. A touch more formally, is there an open interval containing zero where this function is defined except possibly at zero itself? No. An open interval containing zero is going to have to contain some negative numbers, and that's a problem for this function. So there's a, no, there's a more formal reason that the two-sided limit doesn't exist. One more time, I'm warning you, you don't evaluate limits by substitution. Because if you did, you just plug in x equals zero, you get zero, and that'd be the end of the story. That ain't how limits work. It's a lot more complicated than that. And the problem is square roots of negatives. Not a square root of zero, that's not the problem. It's the square roots of negatives. Can you tell me what X is when I write something like this? Uh, it's like badgering the witness. Well, I, I can't give you a straight answer. Uh, X is close to zero. That means all that stuff about the deltas. Um, but I can't tell you exactly what X is. That's not how limits work. I can tell you X is close to zero. It could be close to zero and positive, could be close to zero and negative. I can't really put my finger on what X is when I write a limit statement like that. Here, we don't have that problem with square roots and negatives because here we're choosing X values close to zero and bigger than zero. All right, so let's go through the epsilon delta thing. Uh, you've been through, uh, you've been through worse than this on the epsilon delta thing. All right, and the graph of the square root function is just half of a parabola, so it's not quite so hard. I and mean, here's the graph. It's not quite so hard for a given epsilon to find a corresponding delta. Uh, first off, uh, we need to make sure that f of x equals the square root of x is defined on an appropriate type of open interval. For one-sided limits, as x approaches c equals zero, we want it defined on an interval of the form c to b, where b is greater than c. Uh, we want it defined on an interval from zero to b. In other words, because c, the limit that x is approaching, the value x is approaching, 
uh, is zero. So we want the square root function to be defined on an interval of the form zero to something. Uh, how about we take zero to one? That'll do, say. I mean, you do pick anything where B is greater than zero and you're good to go. So indeed, uh, this function is defined on an open interval that starts at zero and goes to the right a little bit, say one unit, 10 units, 100 units. But it's defined in the right place. By the way, it's not defined to the left of there, but that's not our problem because that limit doesn't exist. So let epsilon be greater than zero. We want to make the function values to be within epsilon of the alleged limit value zero. So I go up a distance epsilon. Technically, I go down a distance epsilon as well, but they didn't draw that. This is scanned from the book. Um, because I know the function's not negative. It's a square root. Square roots are never negative. We've been through that. Uh, maybe in the appendix, and we went through some of that. Square roots are never negative. If you want the negative square root, you gotta put the negative sign out front. So the function has a graph like this, and um, there's no need to consider what happens in the bottom half of the yellow band. If I were making this image, I'd probably draw the bottom half of the yellow band as well. Uh, but it won't affect any of the computations here. So uh, here's the graph, here's the epsilon. So we've gone from zero, the limit value up a distance epsilon, and I would say down a distance epsilon as well. How close to zero do you have to get and to the right, the positive side of zero, to get the function to lie inside this epsilon band, this yellow band? Uh, we can go as far as over here. So right there, the function exits the yellow band and goes above the yellow band. So don't go beyond there. I go beyond there, I've got bad function values that are outside the yellow strip. So stop there, it's a corner where we get an intersection. Um, if we put delta equals epsilon squared in as an x value, take the square root, we'll get the square root of epsilon squared, that's epsilon. Epsilon's positive, so I don't worry about absolute values. So indeed, this distance here is uh, delta, which we'll take to equal epsilon squared. To find the delta values, you need, you need to deal with inverse functions. So they can't give us a very complicated function in this kind of question because we can't find the inverse function. I can find the inverse of a square root function. It's a squaring function. So there. Uh, but if we had an algebraically complicated thing up here, we, we probably couldn't realistically find these delta values. But for this one, we'll take delta to equal epsilon squared. So there's the inspiration based on the picture. Uh, there's a little argument about that picture. So we'll choose delta to be epsilon squared. Now we need to go through with that. If the x values lie here, then the function values lie there story. If, and the limit as x approaches zero from the positive side, we take x and sandwich it between c and c plus delta. Uh, c is zero, x approaches zero. So here we'll take x between zero and zero plus delta. Uh, we just said let's take delta equal to epsilon squared for reasons explained up here. All right, so what we've got is zero is less than x is less than epsilon squared. All right, uh, we wanna talk about the function value the function is the square root of x. So let's take square roots of those three parts. Square root function is an increasing function, right? Just happen to have a copy of the square root function right here. It's increasing. Put in bigger numbers, get out bigger numbers. So I mean by increasing. Should be part of your pre-calculus past. We'll deal with it again when we talk about graphs though. But it's a square, it's an increasing function. Uh, so inequalities are preserved. We get the square root of zero is less than the square root of x is less than the square root of epsilon squared. Let's drop that zero part because we don't need it. Square root of epsilon squared is the absolute value of epsilon, but remember epsilon is positive. Epsilon is always positive, so I can drop the absolute values in this case. Don't just willy-nilly drop absolute values. They matter. Uh, if you can give justification for, ju for dropping them, and that justification would be, I know this thing is positive or not negative, then you can drop them. And we'll often do that, but don't just willy nilly drop absolute values. Be careful with that, it's a common mistake. So we've got square root of x um, less than epsilon. 
if you like, uh, we could write that square root of x, which we know to be positive, is the absolute value of the square root of x minus zero. Square root of x minus zero is the same as the square root of x. Remember, square root of x is non-negative, I should say, non-negative. So the absolute values have no effect. This thing here is non-negative. Uh, and square root of x is f of x. I put the minus zero in there because that's rumored to be L. So this is f of x minus L, absolute value of, and we just showed that is less than epsilon. Less than epsilon. What we did was show if, so I can't highlight in, in these types of slides, if this occurs for the x values, then this occurs for the function values. And that's exactly what the one-sided limit equals L meant. So the limit as x approaches zero from the positive side of the square root of x equals zero by the definition of one-sided limit. Anthropomorphically, look at the graph. Does it try to pass through a point over here? Yeah, it tries to pass through the origin. Or, I'm sorry, it tries to contain the origin. I probably should say contain for one-sided limits. Uh, by the way, it does, but, but that's irrelevant. So it tries to pass through this point, tries to contain this point, all right, and that's the one-sided limit. But here's the rigorous definition style of establishing that. Okay, let's see, back to the notes. Uh, in theorem 2.1, we stated a whole bunch of properties of limits, if you will, properties of two-sided limits. Uh, the sum rule, the product rule, quotient rule, power rule, root rule, difference rule, etc. So we had all those things about um, products and quotients and sums and so forth. Uh, all those things hold for one-sided limits as well. If you take the two-sided limit result, those also hold for one-sided limits. Um, for polynomials, you can evaluate limits of polynomials by substitution. Yeah, you can evaluate limits, one-sided limits, uh, also holds for one-sided limits. You can evaluate one-sided limits for polynomials by substitution as well, and with rational functions, as long as you don't get division by zero. Those results concerning um, two-sided limits from section 2.2, I think it was, those hold for uh, one-sided limits as well. And in fact, um, the sandwich theorem also holds for uh, one-sided limits. All right, can we relate one and two-sided limits? Shouldn't be a surprise that we can. Uh, let's have a little bit of conversation before we get into that. If the limit as x approaches c from the positive side of f of x equals l, we're requiring f to be defined on the interval c to b. x value is a little bit bigger than c. If the limit as x approaches c from the negative side of f of x equals l, then we're requiring that f is defined on the interval from a to c. x value is a little bit less than c. If both of these hold, then I could paste these two intervals together and say f is defined on the open interval from a to b, except possibly at c itself. The a to c part comes from here. The c to b part comes here. Neither of these contain c itself, so I don't know what happens at c. It doesn't matter anyhow, because we're talking about limits. So there's where we pick up pasting these together, the except possibly at C itself thing. Uh, of course, it doesn't matter what happens, does not matter, uh, does not matter what happens at X equals C, one-sided, two-sided, any of that. Um, if both of the one-sided limits exist and are the same, which symbolically I had written up here, I said they're both L, then the two-sided limit exists, it turns out. Uh, and if the two-sided limit exists and equals L, then both of the one-sided limits exist and equals L as well. It largely follows from um, the definitions of one and two-sided limits, but to formalize it, theorem 2.6, the relation between one-sided and two-sided limits says, Suppose that a function f is defined on an open interval containing c, except possibly at c itself. 
then f of x has a limit as x approaches c if and only if it has a left hand and right hand limits there and those one-sided limits are equal. I love symbols in math. So in other words, the two-sided limit as x approaches c equals l if and only if both of the one-sided limits as x approaches c, both of them equal l. And that shouldn't come as a surprise to you. We've seen the, the graphs of the functions have little holes punched in them. I could have talked about those as one or two-sided limits. We did an example a while ago where we address one-sided limits and we had a function that had a hole punched in it at the origin. But this is uh, maybe particularly useful in dealing with piecewise defined functions. Let's look at exercise 50. Okay, talking about uh, one-sided limits. And even functions. So this is a symmetry type thing here. So suppose that f is an even function of x. Does knowing that the limit as x approaches two from the negative side of f of x equals seven tell you anything about either the limit as x approaches negative two from the negative side of f of x or the limit as x approaches negative two from the positive side of f of x? Give reasons. All right, even function, let's start with that. Recall that an even function satisfies the relationship f of negative x equals f of x. Likely you saw this in pre-calculus. Such a function has a graph that's symmetric with respect to the y-axis. Um, y equals x squared is an example of an even function. If I plug a positive or a negative function into the squaring function, man, it gives me the same output at three and negative three is nine in both cases. At, uh, four and negative four, it gives 16 out in both cases. It gives the same value out at any value as it gives out at the negative of that value. The squaring absorbs the negative signs. Raising to the fourth power absorbs the negative signs. That's the reason they're called even functions. Um, if we had only even exponents in a polynomial, that's an even function. Um, cosine functions are even functions. And, uh, Search your memory, you know it to be true. Cosine and negative theta equals cosine theta. It's one of them trig identities from back in your sorted past. So cosine functions are another example of an even function. Uh, so that's what even function means. And we're asked about a one-sided limit. All right, even functions, they're symmetric with respect to the y-axis. So that'll have sort of a geometric implication about this one-sided limit. So when we consider x approaches two from the negative direction, this is the information we're given, we've got x in an interval of the form, um, let's see, it's close to two and on the negative side of two, it's something of the form two minus delta to two. That is, we've got x between two minus delta and two. Well, I know function f does the same thing to negative x that it does to x. And I know what happens to these x values. What's that tell you about negative x? Well, let's take this inequality, multiply through by negative one. Negative, negative, negative. You have to reverse the inequalities when you multiply through by negative. So we'll take care of that. Um, let's write it as we've done recently in terms of uh, least to greatest. So negative two is less than negative x is less than negative two plus delta distributed the negative sign here, wrote it in the opposite order. These are how the numbers appear along the number line. And uh, so let's see, negative x is close to negative two, <coughs> excuse me, close to negative two and bigger than negative two. Uh, these, are, these negative x values are on the positive side of negative two. Well, f of x and f of negative x, they get the same behavior because f is an even function. The behavior of f of x for these x values, two minus delta less than x, less than two, must be the same as the behavior of f of negative x for these negative x values. That is negative two less than negative x, less than negative two plus delta. Think, think mirror image. We've got x values close to two and less than two. Fold that collection of values about the y-axis and you get x values close to negative two 
and greater than negative two. In both cases, they're closer to the origin than two and negative two. Algebraically, we get this relationship here. So we know f of x minus seven absolute value of is less than epsilon, say, for these x values, given this limit as x approaches two from the negative side of f of x equals seven. I know f of x minus seven, an absolute value can be made less than epsilon for appropriate x values. That is x close to two and less than two, close to two and on the negative side of two, right? Well, then f of negative x must do the same thing for this collection of negative x values, right? Same implication that we had for x implies this inequality for negative x. In other words, if x is close to two and less than two, negative x is close to negative two and greater than negative two, greater right there. So uh, if we were to take this and substitute, let's uh, re just replace the dummy variable negative x with x itself, substitute x for negative x so that it doesn't read f of negative x, but f of x. I know those to be the same anyhow. Less than epsilon, uh, if I've substituted there, I should substitute over here correspondingly for negative two less than x, less than negative two plus delta. Hey, you've got f of x minus l, absolute value less than epsilon, that's a limit. It's a one-sided limit, where are the x values? Close to negative two, so it's a one-sided limit as x approaches negative two, first off and bigger than negative two, that is on the positive side of negative two. So secondly, it's a limit as x approaches negative two from the positive side of f of x, and it also equals the L value seven. It's a mirror image, that's what you've done in terms of these one-sided limits, and it works because we have an even function. If we had an odd function, odd function spit out negative signs, we could probably deduce what goes on there as well. It'd be a little bit more complicated. That's probably some of the homework exercises. Uh, about the other one-sided limits, we don't know anything. They gave us information about what happens for x close to two and less than two. We were able to deduce from that information what happens for x values close to negative two and on the positive side, greater than negative two, but nothing else. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't tell you about any of the other limit stuff unless they told me more about uh, the limit as x approaches positive two. They told me the limit as x approaches two from the positive side of f of x equals whatever, then we could do a mirror image thing. But they didn't give us that information. This is the only thing we can conclude from what was given. Back to the notes. All right, I've been uh, complaining periodically about uh, making tables. Let's see what set me off about that. Let's look at example 2.4.4. Uh, I've modified it oh so slightly. Let's consider the function f of x equals sine of pi divided by x. A graph looks something like this. Scan from the book. Uh, it was sine, try to get the name of the function on the screen at the same time. It was sine pi over x. So it's got problems at zero, it's undefined at zero. And when X is close to zero, what's gonna happen is this sine function is gonna oscillate like crazy. We've seen this kind of example before. So what happens is uh, when X gets smaller, pi over X gets larger and larger. So when X changes a little bit, pi over X changes a lot, and that produces a lot of oscillation. It was a sine function, it oscillates between negative one and one. I can't talk about one-sided limits or two-sided limits in terms of trying to pass through a point or trying to contain a point. None of that stuff's happening. I see that limit doesn't exist because they've given us the graph of it. But um, let's make a table of x and f of x values and see what happens when x is close to zero. Let's plug in a one, one half, one third, one fourth, to a ninth, a tenth, maybe one one hundredth, one one thousandth, one one millionth, if you like. Every time you do that, you get zero out. This function's got a lot of intercepts where you're producing 
zero function values. Every time the blue curve crosses the axis, you got a y value of zero. Maybe this is a, a one, and this is one half, and this is one third, and one fourth, and one one hundredth, and so forth. It's going to oscillate infinitely many times, so there's a lot of places it crosses the axis. The limit doesn't exist, but if I make a table and I choose these fairly reasonable x values, I mean, we're approaching zero, I'm always getting function values of zero out. That makes it appear that the function's approaching zero. It makes it look as if the function is zero all the time. Well, it ain't. I just had the misfortune of choosing some fairly natural numbers to choose that always produced an output of zero. That's why graphing and making tables, well, making tables uh, is misleading. Uh, graphing, well, we take them at their word when they give us a graph. We're okay at graphing, but not great. We will be. But limits, Guessing limits based on a table is just, I'm not going to subject you to that. It can be misleading. Here's an example where it's totally misleading. Uh, you get all these zero values out, but it, it's not, it doesn't have a limit of zero. The limit doesn't exist. Look at the graph of the function. So these making tables things, these are misleading. It doesn't matter how did I word it here. Uh, when considering a limit, the behavior of a function at a particular set of x values, that ain't what matters. It matters what the function does for all x values close to c. What's that mean exactly? This, this stuff here in terms of a two-sided limit or um, these two things here in terms of the one-sided limits for all x values close to c, by which I mean one of these three things here, depending on two or one-sided limits. That's why making tables is a bad idea. And I mean, there's a concept when X gets close to this other value, the function values are getting close to their limit value. That I'll stand by, but I can have some perverse functions and that one's got a wild graph, but that ain't that complicated a function. Sine pi over X, not that complicated a function, yet it produces this horribly misleading table. We're not gonna make tables in here. All right, let's see. We can use um, the sandwich theorem to address limits involving trig functions. Uh, we stated that previously. There's a little bit of white space there I need to fix. Um, let's use the sandwich theorem to establish uh, a couple of limits that are going to play a giant role later on. We want to show the limit as theta approaches zero of sine theta over theta equals one, and we're going to approach it with a one sided limit. Let's look at a proof of that. Uh, by the way, you can't plug in theta equals zero, of course, or you get division by zero. Um, can you factor a theta out of the sine function? Yeah, I don't think so. Ask me again around the end of calculus, too, when you do series. Uh, but right now we're stuck. And uh, we've done this before where we've used the sandwich theorem. When we introduced it, we used it on trig functions. So a very common application of the sandwich theorem is to trig functions. Okay, so this is a standard calculus one argument. We're gonna establish that the limit as theta approaches zero sine theta over theta equals one. Theta measured in radians, we'll see why in a second. All right, first, suppose theta is positive. So first we'll look at a limit as theta approaches zero from the positive side. Theta is close to zero, so we can assume that it's less than pi halves. My answer, the idea is it's small. And we draw a picture like this. All right, so theta is positive and less than pi halves, so that'll give us an angle in the first quadrant. What we're gonna do is look at the unit circle. So here's the unit circle. Here's the point one zero, the point zero one over here along the uh, y-axis. So we are looking at a unit circle here. Here's theta. You know on the unit circle from your pre-calculus experience, we find a point on the unit circle. The terminal side forms an angle theta with a positive x-axis. Then the coordinates of that point are cosine theta comma sine theta. The x-coordinate is cosine theta. The y-coordinate is sine theta. Awesome. That gives us a little right triangle here 
with this distance is cosine theta, this distance is sine theta, hypotenuse is one, we're looking at the unit circle. Um, maybe another observation, if you'll extend that terminal side up until it intersects this vertical line, the length of that vertical line will be tangent theta. Uh, I think I can talk you into that. Consider the slope of this terminal side. It'd be a rise over run. It'd be sine theta divided by cosine theta. Sine theta divided by cosine theta. It rises sine theta and it runs cosine theta. Uh, sine over cosine, hey, that's tangent. Or if I look at it in this sense, it rises an amount tangent and in that amount of x values, it ran an amount one. So the slope is also whatever the length of this yellow thing is divided by one. I know the slope's tangent theta from the previous argument. This must be tangent theta. And possibly you've seen tangent theta introduced on the unit circle like that before. Let's talk areas. We're gonna compare the area of triangle OAP, OAP, okay, it's this triangle here. It's not a right triangle. It's okay, I can find its area still. Base and height will be easy enough to do. Sector OAP, okay, that's the little chunk of the circle, the slice of pizza, determined by angle theta. So it runs along the x-axis, along the circle, and then along this line here. So it's a little slice of pizza there. Notice it's a bigger area than the area of triangle OAP. And then we're gonna look at the area of triangle OAT. OAT. From the picture, you see the area of OAP is less than the area of the sector, and that in turn is less than the area of the triangle OAT, the big triangle. All right, so we've got the big triangle, the sector, the little triangle, um, this little sine theta, cosine theta one, that little right triangle, we're not gonna directly use that. Indirectly, yes. But the, the topic of conversation is the OAP triangle, the sector, and the biggest triangle. We can find the areas of these things and we know the relationship on the areas in terms of little, medium, large. Triangle OAP, uh, OAP, we need one half the base times the height, area of the triangle. Uh, the base is one unit circle and the height is sine theta. So we'll get one half times one times sine theta. So the area of triangle OAP is one half sine theta. The area of the sector, where you find areas of sectors determined by a central angle of uh, size theta in a circle of radius r. It's one half r squared theta I mean, hopefully that rings a bell. When you measure the angles and radians, this is where the radians part comes in. So when you measure angles and radians, it's, it's relatively easy to find areas of sectors. It's one half radius squared times the central angle theta. Our radius is one, we're looking at the unit circle, and the central angle is, uh, I don't know, it's theta. So we get one half times one squared theta, that's theta over two. The big triangle, one half base times height, uh, base is one, Height is tangent theta. We get one half one tangent theta or one half tangent theta. So little triangle has area one half sine theta. Sector has area theta over two. Big triangle has area one half tangent theta. So we get the relationship one half sine theta is less than one half theta is less than one half tangent theta. All of it coming from the little picture there. Okay, so let's rewrite that. Remember, we're taking a limit, what was it? Limit of sine theta over theta. You see a sine theta over theta here? You know. Well, you're good. Okay, uh, so we got this inequality based on the geometry of that picture. Let's divide all three terms of this inequality by one half sine theta. If theta ain't zero, then um, this quantity is not zero. Remember theta was uh, between zero and pi halves, excluding the endpoints is how we should choose it. So we're gonna divide each of these by one half sine theta. All right, um, that's positive for these values of theta. We're learning about a one-sided limit. 
do the division, uh, divide this by one half sine theta, that just gives us one. The fact that this is positive means I don't have to reverse inequalities. Take one half theta, divide it by one half sine theta, the one halves cancel, leaves us with theta over sine theta. Ooh, we're looking for the reciprocal of that actually. So, so we're getting closer. Take one half tangent theta, divide it by one half sine theta, the one halves cancel, does this ring a bell? Tangent theta divided by sine theta equals one over cosine. Tangent is sine over cosine, and we've divided by sine, leaving us with one over cosine. However, you've got that in your heads. This is a legitimate computation. All right, uh, now let's take, uh, let's take reciprocals of these. By the way, all three of these numbers are positive. Taking reciprocals reverses inequalities, positive numbers. One over one is one, and it's now the biggest one. One over theta divided by sine theta is sine theta divided by theta. That's why we're taking reciprocals. One over one over cosine theta is just cosine theta. So take reciprocals, reverse the inequalities. Uh, I've write, written it in the reverse order then uh, with less thans. So what were we going to do? Use the sandwich theorem. We've got the thing we're interested in, sine theta over theta, sandwiched between one and cosine theta. Let's run back real quick and look at the question. Trying to show the limit as theta approaches zero of sine theta over theta equals one. We've got sine theta over theta sandwiched between one and cosine theta. Excellent. The limit as theta approaches zero from the positive side of cosine theta equals one. Think about um, what the cosine function tries to pass through when theta is close to zero, tries to pass through the point zero one. We actually established this using, uh, I think using the sandwich there uh, in an example in section 2.2. But this limit is legitimate. In fact, as a two-sided limit, it's legitimate. Um, so we get the limit as theta approaches zero from the positive side of cosine theta equals one. Uh, the upper bound is one. So here's what's going on sandwich theorem style. We've got this inequality. This is sandwiched between cosine theta and one. When theta is close to zero and positive, this is close to one. This is one. That's sandwiched between those two. This must have a limit of one as theta approaches zero from the positive side as well. So apply the sandwich theorem, having the desired quantity sandwiched between these two things, both of which have a limit of one as theta approaches zero from the positive side. And so the limit as theta approaches zero from the positive side of sine theta over theta also equals one. We're trying to show the two-sided limit though. Here's why we had to do it one piece at a time. That picture was only good if we drew things in the first quadrant. We could draw another picture with things in the second quadrant and deal with theta close to zero and negative. Second quadrant, sorry, be the fourth quadrant. We could draw another picture, uh, but we can actually get the information we need out of what we already know from this. Um, sine theta and theta are both odd functions. The sine of negative theta is the same as the sine of theta. Um, no, excuse me, uh, sine of negative theta is the same as negative sine theta, odd functions, spits negative signs out, it's a way to think of it. Um, if we'll take the sine of negative theta over negative theta, so replace theta with negative theta here, I can bring the negative sign outside of the sine and cancel with that negative to leave us with this. So what the punchline is the function sine theta over theta is an even function. So it does the same thing for positive, it does the same thing for positive numbers as it does for negative numbers. So if we wanna take a limit as theta approaches zero from the negative side, that's the same as a limit as theta approaches zero from the positive side, because this function sine theta over theta does the same thing for the little positive values as it does for the corresponding little negative values. Similar to what we did with that limit with seven in the example before. So we've got the both of the one-sided limits equal to one. Now I can use finally theorem 2.6, the relationship between uh, one and two-sided limits to say if the one-sided limits are both one, then the two-sided limit is one. For reasons to be made apparent later, this is a really important limit. Uh, we'll use this quite a bit in uh, chapter three. 
when we do derivatives of trig functions. So that's the reason this has played so much of a role. It's really the reason we've, we've needed the sandwich there to get this limit done and this one. All right, another example, uh, limit as h approaches zero, cosine h minus one over h equals zero is the claim. Show that. All right, well, I know something about um, sine, sine h over h, if you like, the thing we just had. Uh, if we could introduce sines, maybe we could use that, and you can. Oh, can you plug in h equals zero? No, you get zero in the denominator. Then don't do that. Let's multiply by cosine h plus one over itself. So we're multiplying by this version of one. Why is that? Uh, because then when you distribute, this reminds me of multiplying by the conjugate when we had the square root stuff, then we'll get cosine squared h minus one in the numerator, foil it, you get that difference of two perfect squares. In the denominator, well, we've got h times cosine h plus one. Hey, but um, cosine squared minus one is sine squared. Take cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. Hopefully your favorite trig identity, rearrange it. You'll see cosine squared minus one equals sine squared of H. All right, uh, oh, uh, so that gives us a sine squared in the numerator. That's why we did this multiplication in hindsight. And now we've got a sine H over H. And we know what that is as h approaches zero. That's the thing we just did. We got some other stuff left over too, so we'll have to deal with that. But we've got sine h over h, limit as h approaches zero. That part of it, that has a limit of one. We just showed that. But then we've got another sine left over and this cosine h plus one stuff left over. Well, the limit of the product is the product of the limits. So we'll write that as a product of two limits, product rule from theorem 2.1. Um, assuming both of the constituent limits exist. Okay, here's where we left off on the last slide. Uh, the limit as h approaches zero of sine h over h. That's what we had, we had thetas in it before, but that's the thing we just showed has a limit of one. Replace that with one. Now that leaves this quotient here. The limit of the quotient is the quotient of the limits if nothing goes wrong in the denominator. Limit as h approaches zero of sine h it's a sine of zero, that is zero, as an example, which we showed that. The limit as h approaches zero of this, maybe use the sum rule as well. It's a limit of the first, which gives us a cosine of zero, also shown in that example. You can evaluate limits for trig functions by substituting in. Um, it turns out if you don't, so if something doesn't go wrong, I mean, I can't take the tangent of pi halves, for example. Sines and cosines, limits can be evaluated by substitution. Technically, we've only established that when we're having limits as the variable approaches zero. That's what's been shown in example 2.11. And that's all we need here. So we can substitute those zeros in. We get zero over two. Nothing wrong with that. That's just zero. We were trying to show that limit zero. There you go. So that, that's dependent on the sandwich theorem. I mean, we used um, the fact that this little limit here is one and that requires a sandwich theorem. So ultimately this is based on the sandwich theorem as well. So there's two results involving um, trig functions. Uh, here's another one. So let's just do a handful of examples here at the end of this section. Evaluate the limit as t approaches zero of 2t over tangent t. All right. We don't know much about limits of trig functions other than sines and cosines, those two things that we just showed. So let's take this tangent function and write it as sine over cosine. Let's see if we can get to something we recognize. Tangent is sine over cosine. Make that substitution in the denominator. Um, Take this compound fraction, bring the cosine to the numerator, simplify it. So we get a limit as t approaches zero of, uh, I can bring the two out front, constant multiple rule, t times cosine t divided by sine t. Hey, there's a, a, a sine t over t. Well, it's t over sine t, but we'll take care of that. Here's something that looks familiar. So we could write this, if you like, as, um, the limit as t approaches zero of t over sine t 
times the limit of t approaches zero of cosine t. So we pick these two parts off and put them here, pick this part off, put it over there, and written the limit of the product is a product of the limits. Product rule, provided the constituent limits exist. Product rule from theorem 2.1. So I, I skipped a step of arithmetic there. It's about time. Um, well, how about we take t over sine t and write it as one over sine t over t. Let's just put it back down here in the denominator and get this thing here. We know how to deal with sine t divided by t. So I'll put it in the denominator as such. It's just a creating a compound fraction from a non-compound fraction. I would do such a perverse thing because I know how to evaluate the limit of the thing in the denominator. All right, and now we've got a limit of a quotient. So let's write that as a quotient of the limits. Limit is t approaches zero of one. Of course, that's one. Limit is t approaches zero of cosine t. We were just saying, oh, that's, that's the cosine of zero. That's one. We showed it in an example. We used it in the previous question. And we went through this to get this. Limit is t approaches zero of sine t over t. Oh, that's the first thing we did with the sandwich theorem there. That's, uh, that's one. So we know how to evaluate all of those limits, just repeating it from the previous slide. Of course, the limit of the constant is one. Uh, we had an example somewhere back there, maybe it was this one, uh, that told us limits of constants are those constants. Uh, the limit as t approaches zero sine t over t, that's the uh, example we just did. Uh, uh, theorem 2.7, is that what it was? This is the example we just did. Uh, limit as t approaches zero sine t over t uh, produces the one down here and the limit as t approaches zero of cosine t let's see uh, that's cosine of zero that we showed in one of these examples back here we've got two times one times one times one we get out a limit of two so that must be the answer so there's another uh, limit involving trig functions uh, this time around we changed it into sines and cosines, a common trig manipulation because you kids know a lot about sines and cosines. Now you know some limit stuff about sines and cosines. Exciting. All right, uh, that was, uh, wasn't painful enough. Let's go through an epsilon and delta thing. So this deals with um, one-sided limits and a proof. Uh, it's not as tedious as some of the proofs we see. Question is, Given epsilon greater than zero, find delta greater than zero, where the interval from four minus delta to four is such that if x lies in that interval, then the square root of four minus x is less than epsilon. What limit's being verified and what's its value? All right. Well, we're considering x values close to four and less than four as a one-sided limit as x approaches four from the negative side. I can tell that from the structure of it. We'll let c equal four, right? We're interested in this, this four endpoint of this little interval. f of x, of course, is the four minus x square root of function. And uh, l, well, let's see what we're up against here. I got some ideas. We want x to be in the interval from c minus delta to c. In this case, it's the interval four minus delta to four. So that's why we take the C to be four. And we want that to imply F of X minus L is less than epsilon. F of X, four minus X square root of, we want that to be less than epsilon. Okay, um, let's subtract zero from it. So it'll look like this, put absolute values around it. So it'll look like this. Otherwise, I mean, that is four minus X square root of. Remember square roots are non-negative. I can justify dropping the absolute values there. So we'll have f of x minus l as this quantity less than epsilon. So the l value must be zero. So there's the argument that I want to take l to be zero. All right, um, so that introduces the c's and the l's and the f of x's. x in the interval from four minus delta to four means as an inequality, x is greater than four minus delta and less than four. Okay, we want to talk about uh, this function value up here. Remember, we're, we're finding delta with the following computation. So I want to see in the middle 
square root of four minus x. Let's get the negative there first. We've done this before. Multiply, uh, let's see, what are we doing first? Oh, excuse me. Uh, let's subtract four first, I guess. So we'll go through and subtract four first. It's written up like that. That'll get a minus four in there, which we'll have to fix with a negative sign. But subtract four from each of these pieces. We lose that four. We pick up a minus four here and we lose that producing negative delta is less than x minus four is less than zero. You don't uh, want x minus four, I want four minus x. Um, so we'll take care of that here uh, with a negative sign. Run through with a negative sign. This becomes a delta, this becomes four minus x, this stays zero, and the inequality is reversed to produce this. So there we go. Uh, let's take square roots. Of the three parts, square root function is an increasing function, preserves those inequalities. We'll get um, zero is, uh, oh, error here is less than, less than four minus x square root of is less than the square root of delta. Square roots preserve inequalities. So we need to take epsilon equal to this thing here. If x is in this interval, then we get the function four minus x square root of to be less than square root of delta. We want it to be less than epsilon, set epsilon equal to uh, square root of delta, uh, and then solve for delta. So we need uh, epsilon, say, to equal the square root of delta or anything um, smaller. Uh, take, uh, take delta to be uh, epsilon squared is what it amounts to. With delta equals to epsilon squared, you'd plug that epsilon squared in here and you get the epsilon. One quick little observation. I gotta make sure I choose um, X values from the domain. So four minus delta can't be uh, too big. Don't make delta bigger than four. So I'm gonna choose a minimum of epsilon squared and four. The second part being tacked on as a technicality to say, yeah, this is actually uh, X values for which the function is defined. And usually you don't worry about delta being large. You're trying to make delta small. We're gonna make it as small as epsilon squared. If, if epsilon is little and less than one, then epsilon squared should be tiny. But technically I need to add in a caveat, a disclaimer that uh, delta is no bigger than four as well. Then we'll have uh, f of x, four minus x square root of, uh, C equals four, as we had above, L equals zero. We're considering X close to four and less than four. In this sense, it's a one-sided limit. It's a limit as X approaches four from the negative direction of this function equals zero. You believe this limit here? Let's talk informally just a little bit. X is close to four and less than four, like a 3.9, 9.99. For 3.9999, 4 minus 3.9999 has 0.0001, I got enough zeros in there, square root of, yeah, it's tiny, it's close to zero. So this does make sense. If I plug in four, <laughs> you almost got me there. You don't plug in values when taking limits. It doesn't matter what happens at four, unless it's a polynomial or a rational function with some additional details. Uh, but think close to four and less than four. Yeah, the input gets close to zero, the square root's close to zero. So this is an intuitively uh, plausible as well. All right, and that takes care of, in one video, uh, section 2.4, one-sided limits. Uh, we got a couple of, uh, couple of sections left in chapter two, so we'll get on that here soon. Have a nice day. I'll see you in section 2.5.